Hey everybody, it's Dean here and I'm with Ant Parsons and he is the director of ALP Synergy. I know him as Ant and we've known each other since what, February time is it? Yeah, a bit earlier than that, November last year. November last year, wow, time goes really fast, doesn't it? It does. Um, so you are, you, we had a conversation beforehand and you work with, and I don't know whether we'll offend people, but I'll say it anyway, bonkers professors. Do you want to elaborate on that? And maybe I shouldn't have said that. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think I think bonkers professors is OK, Dean. Um, so I work with professors who are fantastic at their research. They're, they really know what needs to be done to move on an environment or a water or a sustainability issue. And they can get funding for that. They're good at securing funding from appropriate organisations. But what they then aren't necessarily always good at is getting their links with businesses and industry to be able to translate their research into impact. Okay. And that's really important for them. They want their research to make a difference. Yeah, otherwise there's no point doing it really, is it? if it's just a piece of paper. Absolutely, yeah. Th there is blue sky research out there, uh, you know, fundamental stuff that works out how the world works, how things, how systems operate. Um, I tend to work at the more practical end of research and work with the professors who want to say, well, we've been doing this for years. We now want to see industry pick that up and it to have to make a change in the environment or in society somehow. Mm. So for an example, and um, this is a complete novice looking into your world. So if I say this and I, I, I'm a bit of an idiot, just humor me. So um, research like, for an example, you do a lot with water and how to manage water, conserve water, all that kind of stuff. But the research is things like a university discovers how to make a waterless toilet, for an example, which is a big thing now in service stations around the country. What you're talking about is that you would help the people who've researched and figured out how to do that, translate that to a commercial use that somebody could could develop. Yeah, yeah. potentially. Potentially. The, the, the bonkers professor is likely to have... Uh, worked out how the toilet could be most efficient in that example, um, probably hasn't then prototyped that toilet, probably hasn't worked out who the customers might be and how they might then have that scaled up and taken out to a wider market. Okay. So, so we could help in that example. Um, okay. a, a similar example and one that's very topical, plastics in the environment. Everybody's mm -hmm you know, seen the pictures of the turtles with the plastic around the necks and other things like that. And um, there is a lot of research going on to work out, well, if a if a plastic piece of plastic litter gets into the river in London, where does it go? Yeah. What happens to it? How long before it breaks down? And that that research is is really important for for water companies, for instance, who need to know, well, if we're discharging into a river and people are saying it's full of plastics, are we going to be blamed for that? Yeah. What's our responsibility in this world? And and if plastics are coming into sewers, what do we need to do to manage that? Mm. So it's bringing that research and connecting it with the challenges that that people face and the industry face. Just as an aside, because I know on LinkedIn you you put a lot of stuff about sustainability on your LinkedIn to really champion it. Um, I saw this. We were at a hotel doing one of our training sessions in London and they were giving out plastic cups, clear plastic, you know, like beer, yeah. disposable beer cups. But they said, just be aware that after about three hours, they dissolve. And I was like, what? Really? And then I thought, wouldn't it be great if they could make McDonald's straws out of dissolvable plastic? Because nobody likes paper McDonald's straws, do they? No, no. It, it's I understand why, but I wonder why they can't make the straws out of the same stuff that the cup's made of. Yeah, and, and there is an awful lot of research going into uh, products that can replace our everyday plastic materials. Mm. Um, and, and there's a really important message that isn't necessarily getting out, that nobody is saying plastic is bad. Yeah. It's too much single-use plastic being disposed of. Mm. 
So we need to reduce the single use plastic and we need to use plastics in the right way, in the right place and make sure they're disposed of appropriately. So so let me ask you this, because um, you came you you obviously worked for many years in the public sector, the environment agency. So, you know, you've been involved in a lot of stuff at a 30,000 foot view. So you've seen, you know, we see our, you know, for an example, I get grumpy about my McDonald's straw. Yeah, but you've probably seen what that means on a macro level, working in government and all those kind of places. Um, but there is a perception, and I might offend you, but please don't hang up, um, that the public sector can be quite inefficient in the sense of things take a long time to do. Well, we only need to look at Brexit to, to know that things seem to get more and more complicated. Um how, what's your transition from the public sector to the commercial world been like? Great question. Um, I never quite knew what I was going to have when I left the public sector. I knew I was confident that I had a breadth of experience and transferable skills that I would be able to leave the public sector and find something useful to do. Mm -hmm. um, the things I think, you know, the perception that the public sector is inefficient those sorts of things were the things that made me want to leave. I was leading on innovation in the Environment Agency for two years, and it was very difficult to be able to implement those innovations. So I got frustrated and decided the best thing to do was to leave and take those things forward myself. So, so I left the Environment Agency. I started a couple of businesses, one a social enterprise and one a, a for-profit company. And, and since then, I've been working on those. But it's been very empowering to to leave some of those bureaucratic shackles mm. to hold you back and be able to deliver and get on with stuff, make decisions and be agile as, as SMEs can be. Yeah. And, and I know, you know, the Environment Agency has been innovative and has changed since I since I left. But the public sector, you know, any big organization is always going to be slower than, you know, a slick SME. And I guess the challenge you have as well is you're subject to the political whims and how can I put it? Um, um, oh, I'll make this up on the fly and hopefully we won't like, offend too many people who work for the public sector. Um, the public, A lot of the public sector doesn't go into innovation, I think, because they're worried about it failing. Yeah, because, you know, the political embarrassment, the pressure and all that kind of stuff of everybody blames, you know, the politicians never, never responsible for anything um, versus in business. I feel that the attitude is, well, it can't fail. You know, we're going to do it and we will make it work. We will find a way, whereas there's almost like a risk aversion in the public sector that isn't there in the pro or, or isn't a barrier in the private sector. Well, and, and I think I think things have changed and obviously it's wrong to generalize about the public sector but but some of that is true um fear of failure um political cycles you know yeah. who's going to make a long-term decision if it's going to make them unpopular when it next comes to their appraisal or their um political you know voted back in again who's going to yeah. make a decision about something that's 10 years down the road if it's yeah. going to feel bad for the first six years. So yeah. I think with with businesses, they can make good decisions that are more strategic. They can think about their long-term future mm -hmm. and they can learn from failure. So it might not be that they, they uh, say it can't fail, but if they do fail, they'll learn from it, they'll pivot, they'll change a little bit. And yeah, the, again, the return is is potentially just as quick in the private sector, you learn from your failure. In the public sector, somebody else beats you up for your failure. Mm. Yeah. So so in your business world, as you go around doing the things that you do now, um, what do you find? Um, what do you find the most di big difference in the way um, you approach things from the, the, the old to the new world? What 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 was the biggest shift for you? Um, my my job now, my business now, is my total passion, my life. Mm. It's everything I stand for. It's 
you know, there, there are four of us, we work together and, you know, we make sure no matter what, that our clients are delighted. That yeah. is our goal. Any, if there's any problems whatsoever, it's resolved instantly. Um, in my old world, you know, I had flexi time. I'd switch off at three o'clock. I worked more hours than I ever should. I made sure I did a good job, but I switched off and I went home and I forgot all about it. And I think for me, that's the biggest difference. That every, every bit of your work means something to you. Yes. Absolutely. I'm not doing it because somebody else has decided it's important. I'm doing it because I really believe in it. Which, you know, if you're running a business is really, really helpful. Yes. Um, so let me ask you, there's a, let's assume that there's a bonkers professor watching this video now. Yeah. Forget everybody else. Just talk, tell me what you want to say to the, what would you, what would you pitch to the, to the bonkers professor in, in, we're both northerners, so we can cut the kind of, uh, the posh waffle that we have to do whilst we're, we're down south. Talk yeah. to the bonkers professor. What would you say to him? So to that bonkers professor, I'd say uh, your excellent research deserves to be out there. It deserves to be delivering the impact. Um, it might be that you've got enough money to carry on with your bonkers research. <laughs> it might be that you haven't. I could help. Let's have a discussion. Let's work out what you've got and how we can build that into a compelling proposal that we can either then take to get more money or that we can take to industry to help you deliver the impact that you need. Wow, that's a pretty good pitch. Is that all right? Yeah, no, that was pretty good. That was, that was, I didn't even tell you that one before. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so let's think about business more generally now, just the normal, you know, yep. You, you come out of the environment agency, you've been a head of innovation, you've probably had loads of people around you to do things, you know, you can focus on your core job. But now you are in a small business with all the challenges of running a business and delivering for clients. What was the biggest challenge you faced in that kind of adjustment world of now you've got to do everything or a lot of everything? Yeah. And, and, and that it, it is absolutely every element. I mean, when you're in a big organization, somebody manages your IT. So you have financial systems, you have HR systems. So in a small business, you have to pick up every single one of those. And I think, I mean, luckily there are, there are a number of us, so we all come with different skills and we've been able to do that. Um, the biggest challenge for me, and it's one that I have to keep my discipline on, is making sure I keep up with my administration and paperwork. I get really passionate delivering the work. And um, sometimes I forget to invoice clients. And it, you know, it could be some way down the road. And I'm thinking, well, the cash flow is not going great. And I realize I've not invoiced a client for six weeks after finishing a piece of work. Um, so for me, it's it's keeping up on on some of those things that are really important in a business, mm. but they're not the ones that you're doing business. That's not why you do the business. Yeah. The 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 mechanics. Yeah, the things that makes the end, you know, it, it's funny because um, a lot of people have the very same issues, albeit everybody's different. So that there's always that kind of bit of the stool, a stool leg missing that they have to kind of lean on one side to hold that bit up, like the weaknesses. Yeah. And I did, um, funny enough, I did a, um, a podcast before this we recorded and um Somebody else was saying, you know, they got investment and the biggest thing they had to learn was to quickly get rid of or automate some of the systems that uh, they knew they were rubbish at because um, it could create problems like that. Yeah. Um, and I think that's common. I'm not good with paperwork. Um, no, actually, it's, I'm the other way around. I'm not good with emails. Yeah. And considering what I do, you think he'd be on it. But the yep, problem yep. is there's so much stuff. There's so much like messages, um, um, emails, in mails, messages on Instagram, all that kind of stuff that emails are just impossible for me to keep up with. Yeah. How do you find dealing with all of this technology and, and using it to promote your business? Uh, are you good, bad or ugly? What would um, you say? 
I think it's a discipline to get into. I've been through, you know, I've been in business now for over five years and, you know, I've been through cycles where I've automated some stuff. So I did at one point put all of my social media onto one automated platform and was, I had set in a process where I was doing it and it started to, f- didn't feel genuine. Yeah. But, so I've, I've, I've stopped that and I've taken back ownership of things. Um, so if, if a tweet goes out or there's a post on LinkedIn, I've written it just before that and posted it and I've meant to post it. Mm. Um, I think, interestingly, some of these bonkers professors that I've worked with or some of the industry people still don't do tech. You yeah. know, they can do their research, but they don't know how to work on a shared document online or how to have a chat with organizations. So some of the, some of the work that we do is actually just helping people to collaborate. Mm. And I just love the range of highly functional free tools that are out there that enable you to do that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've set up and managed Yammer groups. Um, now, I've, I've worked with people who use Microsoft a lot, and they say, oh, you should be on Microsoft Teams now. And it's like, well, I'm working with people that just want it to feel like Facebook. Yeah. They just want to be able to share with partners in other countries, talk about what's going on, deal with challenges, and get away from the emails, but have everything kept in one place. So simple things like Yammer, things like Trello, things like the Google Drive. You know, we use all of those, and to varying degrees with different partners, they all love it. Because it's simple and straightforward, though, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, And, and, uh, you know, I've seen this. A lot of times people obsess about um, technology and it's a great tool, but if you can't manage it all, (laughs) and I think that's a real problem, actually, I think, I don't know whether you find this, is that there's now so much stuff, you actually need somebody to manage the stuff. Potentially, yeah, yeah. But And a lot of our work is is about collaborations. It's it's connecting people together. And that's where the synergy comes from. You bring things together and they're better. Um, so in a collaboration, you have to communicate at the pace of, on the platform of the slowest, weakest person. Mm. It's no good having a highly functional SharePoint site if you're collaborating with people in Indonesia that don't use it yeah, and have never used it because they won't. Mm. So you've got to find the, the platforms and the approaches that will work across a range of partners. Mm. Yeah, so I'm going to ask you a question. You maybe you can't answer it, but let's assume that you are rewinding 20 years. Uh, what have you learned from your business journey over the last five years that you'd want to tell your 20-year? I was going to try and guess your age, but I won't get it <laughs> wrong. Uh, your 20-year younger self. Um, it's probably belief. It's about believing that you can you can really do anything um i i never worry about i have strategies about where the business is going but i never worry about you know the time when when i'm looking six months ahead and thinking well there's not that many clients in that window i don't worry about that i I now believe that just keep doing the good work and the opportunities and the clients will come Mm. and probably 20 years ago i you know i would have been been a bit more worried about how things would go and maybe not believed in myself as much Mm. and and that's probably what enabled me to leave the public sector and the environment agency I've got a lot of friends who are still in the environment agency earning very good salaries and will probably stay there forever Mm. and they'll be reasonably happy but there's probably some holes that they'll never really fulfill Mm. somewhere inside it's one of those things that when you jump into business, you kind of like the the allure of business is taking destiny into your own hands. You know, I'm responsible now. This is my future. I'm building it my way. And one of the biggest fears is you've got destiny in your own hands. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a, a strength and a weakness. Um, the first thing I did, I never had a paid client, a paying client for the first nine months after leaving work. Um, I was looking, but I wasn't necessarily looking that hard. Um, the first and best thing I did was I volunteered at something called the Do Lectures. 
Okay. And I posted about this on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago because it was happening and it happens every year. And it's um, a couple who run this innovation festival. They bring a hundred people together and have it in the bar in a barn on a farm. And it's about people that do. Mm -hmm. And it's just about sharing experience of doing, getting stuck in and succeeding at whatever it is that you want to do. And it was just so empowering. It was fantastic. Yeah. What's the biggest challenge you've had? Biggest challenge? Um, learning some of the skills that I don't feel that comfortable with. Selling, perhaps. Yeah. Um, I'm much, I'm happy to go and network and talk to people, build relationships. I can do all of those things. But then turning that into, okay, well, actually, I think that we should be having a relationship where there's a financial um, connection there. I'm not that good at turning that. But you know what? what's really, really interesting about that? And I'll wrap up in a minute because it is Friday and we probably both want to go and have a refreshing drink of some kind. But um, lots of people who deliver expertise have that same problem. So it's not just... It, because you're having a conversation and and particularly for you and i'm not going to turn this into kind of a therapy session or anything so we'll do that next week yeah, yeah. particularly um you who's so passionate about what you do yeah you you'd do it for free wouldn't you if you're honest if you if you didn't have to earn money you would do what you're doing now for free i uh, yeah and i have done in the past yeah. well don't say that on here because we might have bonkers professors listening <laughs> Um, but you would. So when when you when you're saying you'd do it for free because you would do it for free, that's the price. Sometimes you will attach to what you do, mm. and in that process, you can undermine your own value because you go, "Oh, well, I love what I'm doing. I I do my, you know, I I do it for free if I could. You know, if somebody gave me a, a million pounds or something and I could live forever, I would just do this anyway." Yeah. yeah. But when you just go, "Oh, I'm doing it for free." You've attached zero value to it. Uh, that's one of the things I've been taught. Anyway, I'm on a rant, but <laughs> I'll leave that for another day. Yeah, no, I think there's, there's definitely something in there, Dean. Mm. So I'm going to wrap up with one final thing. You've got a picture on your wall, dream big. What do the next five years look like for you guys? Um, there are some real challenges out there. We've talked about water. Um, there's some real challenges out there with water. Uh, in simple terms, we use too much water and, and that is a societal problem. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's individuals, whether it's businesses uh, and that we have a problem in the UK, even though it rains a lot and we've clearly got floods going on in Yorkshire at the moment. In other countries, that is immense. Um, we're looking currently at how we can upscale and contribute more to really having an impact and making a difference in that water challenge globally. So we're building new relationships with new bonkers professors, with new companies, uh, with new funders, and we're getting new skills within our team so that we can actually try and make a difference there. Mm. We, we want to have an impact on the water challenges globally. Uh, and when you say we have an issue with water in the UK, is that just a fact that we're using more than we're we're able to? Because we're an island, so yeah. I mean, look out the window. It's probably sunny today there. Yeah. Yeah. It was sunny yesterday. You may well have sat and watched the news last night in Yorkshire. Yeah. Where it was absolutely throwing it down, and the dam is collapsing. Mm -hmm. Um. The climate. We have local weather patterns and in the UK we have too much rain in some areas and not enough in others and the, the south and the southeast are facing drought conditions wow and and in the simple to, to a member of the public that could mean you know hose pipe bans to the council that could mean they can't build the houses that people are screaming for because there isn't enough water supply for that to industry that could mean well they need to relocate because they can't get the water they need to operate whatever activity it is they're doing. See, so you, you never think, you know, you never, this is a bit, we need a second part to this, but you don't really think that all of these, you know, 
because we're an island, it rains all the time. We complain about it all the time. You think, why is this an issue? But when you think about it and go, well, actually, it's not. So, it's a bit like cash flow, isn't it? Yeah. You need a steady flow of water all the time. And we have, you know, places where it yo-yos. So Absolutely. we've got one end of the country with this major issue. And then everybody else rejoicing at the sun that's actually making it worse in another. Yeah. And of course, in reality, if we had this real big joined up system where, you know, a bit like oil, we could pump it around the country or gas or something like that, we probably wouldn't have this problem. Maybe that's the solution. Maybe I'm a bonkers professor. Well, and people are looking into water transfer schemes. How do you move water from one place to another? But, and this is where sustainability comes in. If you move a lot of water, and we use a lot of water, it's going to use a lot of energy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we're, we're in a climate emergency, and the government has made a pledge that we're going to hit net zero carbon over the next two decades. So... How do you, fact, and that's where we come in, it's how, how do we factor in all of these really complicating things? Yeah, and now I realise why I'm not doing your job. <laughs> oh. It's a mission. We're, yeah. we're all, I think, and we've all got to do a little bit. So yeah. tonight, Dean, turn the tap off when you brush your teeth and don't flush, the, don't flush the toilet too often. And we're all doing our bit. Okay, I will do that, I promise. <laughs> Fantastic. And this has been an absolute pleasure. You've given me, you know, we hear about all this stuff on the news. We hear about, you know, all these things, even down to, you know, this whole thing with the Yorkshire dam thing. Um, this has been enlightening for me. I'm sure some bonkers professors who are watching this will go, do you know what? I've got some solutions to this and I need somebody to help me bring this to life because that's really what you do. You help bring these things to life. Yeah, yeah. Um so thank you for coming on. Thank you for tolerating my lack of knowledge. Um and uh, no doubt we'll catch up and do this again, but this has been really really good. Uh, everybody if you're watching, you can connect with Ant on LinkedIn. I'll share his URL below this, above this, in the comments somewhere. Um but he'd be delighted to get to know you and if you've got interest in what he's doing and the the mission he's on, connect with him and reach out to him. But thanks guys for watching and we'll see you really, really soon. Thanks Dean.